people call me like they want to sue their brother over their great grandma house. And I'm like, I'm not, see, this is one of those things. I'm not the lawyer for that. I didn't even know this building was for sale. Really? I go to church five minutes from here. Like okay. Around the corner. Um, and I was going to church one, one Sunday morning. It was last year about this time. It was last year, like either right before or right after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to buy 15 South Main Street. Okay. And I said, buy 15 South Main Street? Because I was renting at a building 0.2 miles from here around the corner. Okay. And the Lord said, I want you to buy 15 South Main Street. And like I'm on the way to church. So I'm like, buy. I didn't know I didn't know it was for sale. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a sign in the window. Wow. And I was like, I said, well, God, can I look at it first? <laughs> I mean, I'm sarcastic. God knows that. He loves me anyway. But I was like, okay. And so I looked it up, and it was for sale. And it just got on the market. And oh, wow. it was a firm that had been in here. And God told me to buy 15 South Main Street and do it before the end of the year. Okay. And so he told me that, like, right at the end of November, December. Mm -hmm. Called my realtor friend, say, hey, I need to look at this building in Sumter. It doesn't really matter the condition in, it's in. God mm -hmm. told me to buy it. I'm going to buy it. And the Lord told me how much to pay for it. <laughs> okay. So, um, I came in about mid December, looked at it, it had potential, great mm -hmm. location. Downtown Sumter is thriving. Uh, it's on in the process of a revitalization. Mm -hmm. Businesses are coming back on the corner right over here. They're putting a $3 million beer brewery right here. Okay. They got the restaurants, they got the hotels and stuff down here. So I got in at a great time. Mm -hmm. And so I came in, saw it. I said, I hate everything in here, but I like the location. <laughs> so we're going to cut it. And here we are a year later. I did what the Lord told me to do, and I'm glad I did. That is awesome. I mean, because even when we parked and walking down here, I mean, today there's a parade. So right, I'm a, right. probably a little bit different than normal, right. but, but there no, is still a lot of foot traffic here, here, though. And so, yeah, when I come to work on the weekends, there's parking in the back of the building. I like parking in the front. The streets are lined up. People are down here all the time. Right? Okay. Like the rest of the restaurants, these shops and stuff right here. People are downtown Sumter. So it, it's um, we got in at the right time. Awesome, yep. awesome, awesome. Well, yeah, and then also, I mean, you have this floor, then there are there's more space oh, upstairs yeah. Yeah. to where, I mean, this is a very, very good investment. Oh, yeah, it was. It really was. So, let me tell you how good God is. So I got it at a steal. Um, a little, I told, I got it for $5,000 less than what God told me to pay for it. I told okay. God I made a deal. <laughs> Save you some money, God. Not that you need it. And no, um, I, there's right at 4,000 4, square feet in here. Okay. And so it, it's been fun. Um, I like interior design. I watch HGTV all the time. So <laughs> I, I'm not only am I sitting in my side hustle, uh, in 2019, I got to play with my passion of wanting to do a total gut renovation and picking every piece of material in here from the paint to the flooring to the furniture. So it's been amazing. It's been wow. Fun. Wow. It's been fun. Yep. Wow. Awesome. So now how long has your firm actually been open? I opened Lapkin Law Firm on January 1st, 2015. Okay. Uh, officially. So that's almost five years. Wow. Okay. And um, it was my husband encouraging me to open the law firm because I, I had gotten comfortable with my day job. I had a nice, I still have it. I have a very nice, cushy, executive level job. And I was like, yo, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I have no kids. We're good. <laughs> and um, um, my husband was like, you need to, he was pushing, you need to open Lapkin Law Firm. It'd mm -hmm. be very lucrative for you. Da -da -da -da. I was like, I don't have time for that. And so, like, he just started sending people to me, like, why don't you help this person? <laughs> just, he just came. In typical Jeffrey Lampkin fashion. But I love him for it because, like, four years later, it's just like, wow, you were right. Mm -hmm. And you saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. So I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that he, he spoke that vision, that he pushed me, that he helped me birth this thing. Mm -hmm. I guess that's an interesting way to, you know, start a business. Like, you know, it, I guess for any, any, any spouse out there, if you want a spouse or a friend to start a business, just start pushing yeah, them clients. No, don't do that. <laughs> Jeff Lamb is special. But he, it started out like, hey, I got so-and-so, and so I need you to help them with this. I was like, I, I've never, I don't even know how to practice this type of law. Mm. I came from a corporate law background, real estate, whatever. He's like, oh, you can do it. You're smart. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. Okay, I'm working auto accident cases for your friends because you said I can do it. I, I didn't learn this in law school, never done this before, but he was right. Uh, I could do it. So marry somebody who, who sees things in you that you don't see in yourself. That is awesome. That it is matters. awesome. It helps. Yep. Now, yep. I guess now, what type of law do you practice here? Here, in this firm, I do uh, personal injury. That's auto accidents, mm -hmm. medical malpractice, slip and falls, 
Uh, I do employment law, defense okay. work for companies, and plaintiff work for discrimination type mm-hmm. matters. Uh, I work with uh, estate planning, so wills, power of attorneys, trusts. Uh, I do. I, I don't do a lot of family law because family law is emotional. Uh, I, I would do mm-hmm. an uncontested divorce, meaning I don't like you anymore. We don't need to be married. We try. Let's okay. civilly end this. Okay. I'll go get you divorced in 60 days or less. But okay. um, the child custody and stuff, that, that pulls at your heartstrings. And mm-hmm. so that's challenging. And uh, I work with a lot of churches. I serve as general counsel for one church primarily, but I work with a lot of churches. Churches okay. have a myriad of legal issues from employment matters mm-hmm. to contracts to real estate development. The larger churches have intellectual property matters, uh, things of that nature. So I, give, I work with a lot of churches. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what I do here. Now, I mean, when you came into, uh, let's say, working with the, the churches and the not-for-profit organizations, I guess kind of when you walk in or I guess when they reach out to you, I mean, how much do they know that, hey, we need a lawyer or is it just, hey, let's just get a, 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 an assessment or how does that happen? Uh, I'll say this. It depends on the, not even the size of the church, but the education level and the knowledge of the members, right? Okay. So I'll say this because I'm African-American. A lot of African-American churches, because it's with faith and with God, we feel like, oh, we can do business on so-and-so with a handshake. We love God. They love God. We all good. It's not all good because Satan um, Satan lives at the church and people hustle God all the time. Yeah. And so I, I tell a lot of pastors, leaders, and boards, you need to conduct your church like a business, you need to be a good steward of God's money because mm-hmm. that's what you're using. And so there need to be contractual relationships. You can believe, We can believe in the same God. Let's put it on paper. Have some terms, some conditions, some warranties, yeah. some ways that I can get out of this or see you if it doesn't go well. Um, so let's, let's do that. And so I'm finding now um, people, more and more churches are becoming aware mm-hmm. and seeing the need. Some of them are still good faith. We're good people. They're good people. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of churches are happy to see me walk in the door. Mm-hmm. Because I, I told your wife, I said, I, I give legal guidance from a kingdom-minded perspective. Yes. I'm one of the rare save lawyers, right? That mm-hmm. sounds like an oxymoron, but we do <laughs> exist. And um, so when I when I come in, is not to be antagonistic. is to be a good steward of God's money, his resources, and do business in a way that reflects kingdom well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I and, and I think that's an interesting point because even as I start to look at how, you know, some of the consulting we do, with different businesses and different people that are like, hey, I'm looking to start this business. Mm-hmm. And they'll tell me about this relationship they either have with a vendor or mm-hmm. a partner. And I'll kind of ask, hey, what's the terms of this mm-hmm. a- agreement or what's the terms of this relationship? Friendship. They're like, oh, we're just, we, we know each other. I'm, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, that works if you guys are doing a hobby. Right. <laughs> but right. if you are trying to run a business, like, like you need to be able to clearly spell out, hey, this is what's expected of me, Mm -hmm. this is what's expected of them, Mm -hmm. this is the time frame, Mm -hmm. because, I mean, if you don't have that, I mean, it really does become a messy situation. It can. can. So I always say that having uh, attorneys and contracts with terms in place beforehand, there's no room for gray area, right? We can still be friends, Mm -hmm. but on the business side, let's conduct it like it's real business. Mm -hmm. That's it. No, and I think that's a good point because, I mean, even as you think about, you know, where you're a full-time job and building a business here, I mean, whereas how do you manage kind of switching the mindset? Because who you are in the Lampkin Law Firm is not who you are in your career. How do you manage that? I'm both all day. Okay. And, And so I wear both hats 24 hours a day, so... Thank God I, I'm not schizophrenic. Um, <laughs> sometimes it makes you feel like you're mad, but um, my job, what, what I do in my day, I can't turn it off because of the clientele that we serve mm-hmm. and what we do. And, and my firm, this is my baby, so I'm not going to turn it off. Mm-hmm. So I, I have to do a lot of prayer meditation, time management. Mm-hmm. Um, I, as I get older in my business, I learn that I need help. I need good, reliable people working for me who mm-hmm. see my vision, who operate in excellence, who can help me execute it. Uh, but I manage by having great help, mm-hmm. and that's God. That's amazing staff. I have amazing staff both in Charlotte at my day job and here. So can't do it by self. God and, and a good team. Mm-hmm. That's how I manage. Now, okay, when it comes down to finding good talent, because I think there are 
so many resources out there, whether it's, you know, job posting mm -hmm. boards, whether it's LinkedIn mm -hmm. or, or what, or Indeed or whatever it is, kind of what's your approach to how do you find good people? <laughs> you know, here goes one of the learning things, right? So everyone seems good in the beginning. <laughs> okay. And then sometimes you get on there and it doesn't work. So my approach currently, um, and this is not to sound really, really, really churchy or religious, but now I ask God for what I need and he sends it to me. Okay. And I'm like, hey, God, I need help. Mm -hmm. And literally, he'll say, hey, why don't you call this person? Or somebody will call me, and God will be like, that's them. And so for my firm, what mm -hmm. I do in this business, you know, my day job, you know, we do, we put out the resumes and people interview. Mm -hmm. But on this team, because this team is special, so I need people who believe God, like I believe God, have a similar work ethic, I let God assign the team members because I'm on an assignment. Mm -hmm. this, this whole firm, being in Sumter, sitting in this, this building, I'm walking in God's purpose, so I let mm -hmm. him. I let him pick my teammates. Mm -hmm. Cause I tried to pick my teammates, and I had to fire them. That was uncomfortable. <laughs> 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 it was awkward. It was strange. <laughs> yeah. Now I ask God first, and then it works out. I have not had to fire anybody that God sent. So look at that. That is that. <laughs> I will say having to having to make some adjustments on the team. Like I said, especially when it's not a mutual mm -hmm. agreement, where it's just like, hey. It's not a good fit. They know it's not a good fit. Mm -hmm. You know it's not a good fit. Like, hey, let's let's, let's find a civil way to end it. Right. But when you are like, hey, this is not a good fit, but they're like, they think they're killing it. Right. I mean, it becomes uncomfortable. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So it's, it's part of the, it's part of any profession. You know, great team members are great. But I don't, say, I don't fire anyone. People fire themselves, mm -hmm. right? Because I make it clear what this is what we need. This is what mm -hmm. I expect. Open door, let's talk about it. But if you're not doing the job, then this is not a good fit for you. It's mm -hmm. okay. And I think that's, that's that's very fair because, I mean, I, I look at that even myself where they're, they're in our own business when working with different clients. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I definitely tell my wife and just other people that we're working with is like, hey, everybody is not a good client fit for us. Definitely. We're not a good firm fit for everybody. Definitely. And I think we got to be respectful enough mm -hmm. to say that to be like, you know what? this is not the right client or hey this is not the right relationship we should mm -hmm. have because what we bring to the table what they bring to the table there isn't enough i guess you say synergy value mm -hmm. between the two and it's just like hey you know what it would be better if you got another firm or hey it would be better if we got a different client yeah i do that mm -hmm. i do that even in my own practice so a lot of people call me i guess this is a blessing so since it's something i do in addition to my day job it's not like i need this to mm -hmm. have funds and yeah. so that, the ability to be selective is a blessing. You mm -hmm. just said a mouthful. I'm not a good fit for everybody. Yeah. But the people I am a good fit for, it works. So a lot yeah. of attorneys that do what I do, they like take everything that walks through the door. <laughs> <laughs> My door is never open. It's locked okay. by appointment only, right? So it's just like, um, yeah, you, you have to know your area of the market, know your, your niche, know what works best for you and be comfortable with that, mm -hmm. right? I think it eliminates a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. And I guess, how do you find that? Because what, that's one of the challenges that a lot of business owners have or is as they're developing a business, they're like, they're seeing all these other great things that are going on. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, how do you stay focused to say, hey, you know what? That's not my business. Mm -hmm. This is my business. Mm -hmm. This is what we're focused on. Like, how do you block out the unnecessary noise? Um time and growth and staying off social media <laughs> <laughs> social media it's good for what it's good for but you can also bring in comparison mm -hmm. now you just got to i'm really in tune with who i am i'm really starting to understand uh who god is calling me to be and what i should be doing in this season and i've just learned to be content with what i got and so i'm very spirit led so if god says this is what we're doing right now mm -hmm. Then I'm focused here until he says time to move on to the next thing, mm -hmm. and that is just work for me. Because mm -hmm. if you try to do too many things, uh, th there's a possibility that you can't. Something's going to lack, or you can't do it all well. Yeah. So I kind of just stay on the last assignment God gave me until He tells me it's time for something else. Mm -hmm. That's, that's I, my approach. And I think that that is, that is a very good approach because I mean, when you have that clarity about, hey, this is where my focus is going mm -hmm. to be. And when you know that, it's just like your productivity goes to a whole new level. Yeah. Now, some of this comes with age now because I remember being younger, being all over the place. Now, I'm not going to say, no, I'm not perfect daddy. No, I used to be scatterbrained. And I was trying to do this and that and this and that, and it didn't work. And mm -hmm. so with age came wisdom. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, you know what? 
maybe I should try to do this. And then it was, you know what, God, what do you want me to do, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and that, that's how we're rolling now. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Now, okay, how many people do you have in your firm now, I guess, employed with your firm now? Three. Okay. Three, three, three non-contractual, three on a regular basis. Contract is needed. Okay. But three, three on a regular basis. Yeah. Okay. Now, how do you go about finding kind of those contract relationships? Like, who's the right fit for that? So, now, there, for those I outsource, there are companies that you can contract and get attorneys for. Okay. Short-term projects, long-term projects. So, if I'm getting super, super duper busy mm-hmm. and I need help, then I hit up one of those companies that provide contract attorneys or okay. whatever. And some even with some paralegals, I got a big, a big case, a big whatever. And we set a time frame. I know what the rates are. I tell them what I'm looking for. They send me resumes. I vet them sometime, and then I can find a good fit for me. Okay. And it's short term. There's no contractual relationship beyond the stated term, so I don't have to worry about all the employment stuff. So it mm-hmm. works, right? So mm-hmm. that helps. Um, there are a lot of services like that for attorneys. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when it comes down to, like I said. If someone is going to start a law firm, mm-hmm. what kind of advice or perspective would you give them? Like, hey, these are things you probably should consider uh-huh. that nobody will tell you or that you didn't learn in law school. Hey, <laughs> like, first of all, get a mentor. Uh, <laughs> like, I read a book and prayed. It helped. That mm-hmm. was, there were other ways. And, you know, so like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I learned trial and error. I'm still learning. Um, when I went to law school, the law school that I went to, I went to UNC Chapel Hill. Like, we didn't talk about opening your own practices. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I was at Chapel Hill. We were one of the top law schools in the country, especially for a public law school. So it was graduating the top 25% of your class, go get a firm job, big law in some city, make your X amount of six figures to start. That's what you do. And so I followed that track. I traced that track. So I, I didn't even fathom opening up my own practice, hanging out my own shingle, being in a smaller city or mm-hmm. town. No, I just knew I was going to live in a major city. Mm-hmm and work corporate law at a firm, and that's what I was doing until I met my husband and I had to move and make some adjustments. Mm -hmm. And it's been good, it's been one of the best things that ever happened to me, but I would say, I will tell anybody, find a mentor, find someone Mm -hmm. who's doing what you're doing, what you desire to do, and who's doing it well, and ask them, how did they get there? Read the books, Mm -hmm. pray, but find somebody who can tell you, hey, this is what I did, and this is what I wish I had done, and to get you there faster, this is what Mm -hmm. I think you should consider. Okay. That would be my advice. So what's one of the, I should say, one of the funniest lessons that you kind of learn by trial and error? Or one of the funnier <sighs> ones? Oh, God. <laughs> so some of the things I've learned, like you, we've talked about previously, I'm not a good fit for certain clients, mm-hmm. right? And so uh, for confidential purpose, I can't tell you the story. Yeah. Um, but I'm not a good fit for certain <laughs> clients, and that's okay. And I have to be okay with that. Um I'll tell you one thing about running a law firm. There's there's a major difference between running a law firm and run, practicing law and running a business. Mm-hmm. And so what I found with my firm, I've been so blessed. The business boomed. Okay. But it's like I needed staff. I need um, I need someone who handles payroll and expenses. Um, I know my husband works with you guys for the restaurant. I need an accountant. Yeah. Like it gets real. And so it's just like. I think that you need to be aware of the business side of it because a lot of people can practice law. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to run a business and you want to be profitable, you need to learn how to run a business because now Mm -hmm. you got payroll, you got employees, you have to still run, run, you said still practice law. Mm -hmm. You can't keep the lights on, you can't (laughs) mortgage. So the business side of it and still being able to practice law effectively. So Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's multifaceted. Yeah. And I didn't consider all of that. Mm-hmm. I didn't consider all of that. Yeah. And I think that becomes a very interesting thing for a lot of people because even when people reach out to us and they're like, hey, I want to develop a business plan because I want to start a business. Mm-hmm. And we're like, okay, we can, that's something, that sounds like something we can help with. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more mm-hmm. to see if we're the right fit. And when you're asking questions, like, let's say someone wanted to start a restaurant, and which I went through the same thing with your husband when he called <laughs> me and said he wanted to start a restaurant. Right. I said, all tomorrow. right. Tomorrow, I want to start a restaurant tomorrow. <laughs> But the, the, the thing about my husband is he's going to start it tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. And that was one of the things that I, I asked about. You know, I was like, all right, so let's, all right, it's a great idea, but mm-hmm. let's talk a little bit further. Let's see, because the questions that I'm asking is trying to understand is 
do you really love cooking or do you really want to run the business of a restaurant? Two different things. Because I was like, those are two, two completely things. different things. Uh -huh. And as we kind of went down the questions and one of the things that I talked about, I'm like, all right, so when we start putting together a financial plan, mm -hmm. you're going to start getting a glimpse of, hey, these are the things you need to consider. Okay, what about the vendor relationship, mm -hmm. like buying the food that, so you have food to cook and right. sell. A necessity. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think <laughs> with the marketing. put them on. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. all of the different details yeah. that, that, yeah. that you don't see mm -hmm. when, or you don't think about when you're starting a business, I think that's something that a lot of people overlook. And I, right. I could imagine people are like, oh, I practice law. I mean, mm -hmm. I can just set my How shop up. How hard can up. it be? Yeah. It's hard. I mean, and then you think about, like I said, with the employees. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have another uh, tax situation that you need to think about. Uh, yes. I mean, just I the formal paperwork. Year. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. So, yeah, it, it's a lot to it. And so mm -hmm. anybody trying to start their own business, especially their own law firm, get educated on the business side. Mm -hmm. Right? So you know how to practice law. Learn how to run a business because they are two. Now, I guess outside of what you guys have done in the community and just the relationships that you and your husband have built before starting the firm like have there been other things that you've done to to add more marketing or more visibility to the firm oh man see i think the marketing and the visibility that my firm has i'm amazed at the amount of clients i have mm -hmm. um but i think it's just god set me up for the win so uh, my husband is extremely well known mm -hmm. Um, I'm well known. We're both favored. Mm -hmm. And so like where most people struggle with same thing with the restaurant. Like when a restaurant first opens, you think it's going to be slow. Yeah. It's going to trickle. <laughs> Not us. Y'all was at our opening. Did you get a yes. seat? Like four or 500 people showed up and this is a diner. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. same thing with my firm. It's like, how are these people even hearing about me? Right. Mm -hmm. But God has set us up for the win because, um, social media helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, Jeffrey's on the radio. Yes. He's in all these churches. Mm -hmm. He's well known. My parents were really, really well known. So I get support from back home. Mm -hmm. People I've met along the way. I've been to a lot of schools. I've been to Claflin. I've been to Penn State. I've been to UNC Chapel Hill. So I have all of these networks. Mm -hmm. And like we keep it in the network. And so I mm -hmm. get calls. And then Jeffrey's been all these places. So his network's called. So by the time the business is manifested in our lives, we had already developed mm -hmm. uh, connections and mm -hmm. who we were. And so it just it worked out. Mm -hmm. it, it has worked out greatly. And I think that's very important. I mean, to always constantly be building relationships because I think that that becomes one of the critical areas where any business starts to fall apart, mm -hmm. where, whether it's relationships between the people who work in the business mm -hmm. or relationships with, you know, existing customers or potential customers. Because, right. I mean, I think even on a law firm, I mean, that, that becomes a very important thing of once you bring someone on as a client, like what are the things that you do to really keep that relationship mm -hmm. there? Because, I mean, it is a relationship mm -hmm. of trust because right. they're bringing you their confidential mm -hmm information like how do you keep that relationship going even after let's say the case is settled uh what i what i try to develop with my clients first of all i give stellar service mm -hmm. i give service with a level of excellence um right now with the size that my firm is i'm still able to be hands on i have hundreds of clients mm -hmm. and i have a team but i'm still able to communicate and be hands on with my clients um the greatest thing i can get as an attorney is a return client or a referral from a previous client. Mm -hmm. So relationships matter. So at Lampo Law Firm, I care about you. And not just me, I'm going to help you with your situation, I'm going to make some money, but you are a real person in a, in a real real life. So a lot of my clients, they add me on social media. Mm -hmm. Now they come to the restaurant. <laughs> they text me, hey, Harry, how you doing? Just want to say hello. Mm -hmm. So Jeffrey and I have like this family-like vibe, right? Mm -hmm. We just, it's not just work, we care about people. I think caring about people and being kind that, that develops the relationship, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, yeah, I had you, you were in an accident, you had some kids in the car. How your kids doing? Mm -hmm. Is it time to go back to school? Everybody good? Y'all need anything? Okay. Just check on people. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm Southern and I'm from the country, so that's that's how we grew up. Mm -hmm. So I take that same approach with my clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. And even in, in just the conversations we've had and just the different things I've seen you do on social media, I mean, I see you guys have a very big heart for caring for people and the community. Mm -hmm. So I know um, you guys do special events of giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. What are some of the events that you guys have done in the past couple of years? Oh, wow. Um, from the law firm, I do wills workshops because estate planning in the African-American community mm -hmm. is extremely important to me. So I, I go to churches 
gymnasiums, school cafeterias, and African American communities, and I give away free estate plans. That's like a fifteen hundred dollar value. Mm-hmm. I take my team. We wow. set up a mobile law office, laptops, printers, notaries, and we're doing them on the spot after I do a presentation of why you need them. Um, Jeffrey and I, we give turkeys for Thanksgiving. We give toys for Christmas. Mm-hmm. We give supplies going back to school. We just give whatever because there are a lot of people in need. So God does not bless you mm-hmm. to be selfish, to uh, store it all up for yourself. So And it's just like it's not about how much you have to share what you got because everybody can give something. Yes, uh, I'm just married to a man who whose desire to give matches mine. So mm-hmm. those are a few of the things that we do. We have a summer arts camp that we do week long. We take it to different places in Clarendon County, here in Sumter County, where students can come out and learn about arts and music mm-hmm. and drama. So we, nice. we, just, we love people, mm-hmm. God, mm-hmm. kids. <laughs> so you just share, you know. So that's some, those are mm-hmm. some few things we do. Now, speaking of the estate planning, what are some of the, I guess you say, some of the reasons why people usually don't have an estate plan. <laughs> Two reasons. One, lack of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Two, people think they're not going to die, right? Three, mm-hmm. people think, oh, they'll be fine. My kids got it, <laughs> right? I'm, <laughs> I'm not playing with you. And, and this is what this is what we as African Americans do a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Like, grandma, grandma didn't make a will because she loved all her kids equally. So grandma's not going to leave the house to one kid because the other kids might think grandma loved that kid more. Mm-hmm. But what, what grandma's not realizing is that when you die, your house is going to become air property and we're going to have to split it amongst all of these kids. And mm. if your kids die off, like then it's split between the kids and the grandkids. They can never sell it. There's no marketability. We can't mortgage it. Mm-hmm. And if one person forgets to pay the taxes, it's going to go to the tax sale and we're going to lose it for three or $400. Wow. Right? And so I, always tell, I tell people... You know your children. Pick the child who's most responsible. Put your wishes down on paper, even if it's to never sell the house, sell the house, split the money like this, that, and the third. But land is one of our greatest resources, and a lot of African Americans we lose it because we're not knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. You need wills. You need power of attorneys. And I I got, I actually got started with giving this stuff out for free in 2015. My mom only had one sister. My my mom's sister passed away. She lived in New York on Long Island. Mm -hmm. She was extremely wealthy, highly educated, Ivy League PhD. Um, We were really close, and um, her husband had predeceased her. Her daughter had predeceased her. She got sick with cancer. And I did a lot for her after her daughter died. And I was like, Auntie, let me make you a will. Mm-hmm. And she, I've been asking her to make her will since 2007. She died in 2015. She wouldn't do it. She wow. wouldn't do it. And then she had a granddaughter that she was left here to take care of. And my aunt died in 2015. And, um, and like she had all these properties, all of these things she mm-hmm. owned. And her granddaughter wasn't old enough to take care of it. Um, you know, I had to open an estate, but it's just like it was a battle. Mm-hmm. And it's like like her granddaughter wasn't – she had no plan. Yeah. She had no plan. And, like, some properties were lost because we didn't have a plan. You know how much properties are worth in New York. Yes. So it's just like, no, I don't want anybody else to go through this. So I came home and I said, I'm going to start educating my people. And my aunt knew better. Mm-hmm. But it's just like – that's why I say black people just – they don't want to because they think they're going to live forever, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just like, yeah, yeah we can't do that. We can't yeah. do that. So prepare. You know, prepare. One day you're going to leave here, get life insurance so we can stop doing these GoFundMes for funerals. Mm-hmm. Everybody's going to die. Life insurance is really cheap. Uh, get a will. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Even, you're going to be like, I don't own anything. You own something, even if it's just a car that you drive. It would be really, really easy if you have a will and you leave an executor or a personal representative name who you want to handle your business affairs when it's over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that, that helps. So I, I try to get that message to as many African Americans as I can, because my, my Caucasian counterparts don't seem to have that problem. But in mm. the African American community, I see it. I see it a whole lot. And it's not until somebody dies, and somebody left a little bit of something, and families go crazy at times. I can agree yeah, to all that. Yeah, people I, know about I, that. I have <laughs> seen that. I, I remember when I was in I was in college, and my tax uh, professor, mm-hmm. and so he was also a, a JAG officer, mm-hmm. so we came from a uh, tax kind of legal background, and we were talking about the tax treatment for estates, and mm-hmm. we were talking about the inheritance tax, and he was telling us an example of a client situation, a case that he had to work on, mm-hmm. and he was like, you know, what happened is, you know, the, the aunt died, she left it to, actually, in the will, she left it to her kids, and a distant nephew Mm -hmm. and so they were like you know 
I guess the kids wanted to keep it and he was just walking through, okay, what's the tax treatment, you know, all the different things. And he was like, you know, believe it or not, the case ended up to where they decided to sell the home. Everybody kind of distribute, everybody gets their, their cut of it because he was like, you know, what you don't realize is if you don't have a very clear plan for stuff like that, it gets very messy. Ugly. It gets ugly. People get greedy. Mm -hmm. Um, when people pass away, and I, I don't even know why, but I've just I've seen it, and people call me like they want to sue their brother over their great grandma house, and I'm like I'm not. See, this is one of those things. I'm not the lawyer for that. This is not. No, I don't want that. Y'all should go to church and pray a hug or something. Like I don't know. No, no, no. So yeah, but I see it. I see it. It happens. So it can be avoided. Mm -hmm. It can be avoided. And so, but my concern is not even just the fights. My concern is I know how the legal system works where African Americans, particularly, we are losing a lot of properties mm -hmm. um, to air property. Air property is when someone dies without a will and they're like a million, a million heirs. And we all, now 32 people own this piece of property. Oh, wow. So that I can't sell it without 32 it. signatures. Can you imagine it? 32 black people to agree on selling wow. Big Mama House? Not happening. So yeah. Wow. All right. So you can't do anything with it. You can't mortgage it. You can't. You can't sell it. You can't make any money off of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, and that is that that is a unfortunate hassle. I mean, because, I mean, I can imagine starting a business and having to make a decision where you need thirty-two signatures right. to make a. It, nothing will get happen. done. It's never going to happen. <laughs> Because people who've never had an opinion, if they think they can get two dollars out of it, they got something to say. <laughs> nah, we good over here. So all African Americans have estate plans, wills, and power of attorneys. Like you get sick or you can't handle things, pick somebody who's responsible, who you trust, who can handle your affairs. Thank you for tuning in to the Business Talk Library aired on RETV. If you'd like to see more of the Business Talk Library, be sure to watch us every week on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m.